Today I'm going to be showing you how I went from this to this using Blender and After Effects. Okay, so you want a green screen? Build your cute little sci-fi world or whatever, do some visual effects. Well, have I got the breakdown for you. I mean, it should be easy. Shoot on green, remove the green, profit. But sometimes it's not as easy as it should be. Feathered edges, bit depth, choke, chatter, spill. What are these words? What does this even mean? Last year, I worked with the Chicago Bears at the company I work for, Banner Studios, to create some really cool hype content for the 2023 season. And last year, we went all in on virtual environments. So today, I want to show you everything I've learned, tried, failed at, and experimented with so you don't have to go through the same headaches I went through and maybe even go off and create your own cute little sci-fi film. I don't know what you do in your free time. So I hope you enjoy and uh, get something out of it. We sort of went for Chicago inspired locations. So this is sort of a CTA stop. This I modeled specifically after the Roosevelt stop. This was basically a low poly uh, version of underneath Lake Street. If you've ever seen The Dark Knight where Christian Bale crashes into another van, that is where this scene takes place. And then also one of my favorite virtual environments was the display room. Um, you see this all the time where they build actual LED panels. We didn't do that, so I was like, this could be a cool way to work in highlights, and yeah. So, I want to talk to you about this shot. As you can see, this is the final comp, but we will get there. Let's first talk about Keen. This is sort of the set we were working with. And the first thing I want to say about green screen is to make it dynamic. Safe green screen is boring green screen. That's why you can see we're moving the camera like crazy. We've got intricate lighting. We've got haze, which was a bit of a mistake because it added a lot of spill onto the green screen. But that's okay because Roto is our friend. And so, yeah, we're doing these big camera moves. I think that is one thing that really sells the sort of real virtual environment. Your initial vision of green screen is something like this where it's like a tripod, even lighting, just high key, like you're gathering an asset. So I tried to make it really, really dynamic. Tape, we put on the backgrounds for tracking markers. Green tape, so that I can also key it out. And it worked. Okay, so here's the keyed. And as you can see, the edges are pretty clean. Here is my typical workflow. The right way? Probably not. First off, you want to start off with a garbage mat. I did like a very simple animated mask because one, we had that orange spill and that blue spill and I don't need all this stuff. I just need him. What I want you to think about when it comes to green screen is the silhouette. Once we had that, here is what I do. Make a duplicate. I use the built-in After Effects key light. It's not the best. It's not the worst, but it's a uh, green screen software to plug in. Want to go over here, use the eyedropper, click, and look at how terrible that is. That doesn't work. So after I do some main fine tuning, a lot of times what I do is switch to screen matte. You want white to show, black to be invisible. So I crunch the screen gain a little bit. If you do these sort of clip black and white, this is basically like add contrast. So if I go like that, it sort of gets rid of a lot of the issues, and then you crunch the black, and that sort of goes out of the way. Now, obviously, you can see we have all this stuff in the middle. What I do, leave this top layer on screen mat. Under it, this track, I set the track mat to luma mat. So basically it references the top layer and then it looks at that black and white and cuts out the entire thing. The reason I do this, if you just leave this on final result, I find oftentimes you have to just keep playing with these settings and keep messing about and try to get that color back. All this stuff that it does in the center of the image is not what I want. And so I think there's something about maybe the color information that's used when you turn to screen mat, where it's sort of lower bit depth or whatever the term is. I'm trying to sound smart. Again, this looks pretty clean. If I go to final result, it's messing with my color. It's messing, look at what, I don't want is zero to turn into eaten away zero. Once you turn it to screen mat and you do the Luma track mat thing, it doesn't mess with the color in the center. Then I pre-compose those layers and then it's time for the key cleanup. So scrub through, I'm masking, I'm, I'm keyframing these masks to get rid of all those ugly edges. It's not too hard because the green screen does do 70% of the work, but you do got to clean up. And then after that stuff like this, you can see they very clearly have a lot of green screen spill. So what do we do? I go in, duplicate my layer, patch these up, and then we've got a very clean green screen, but sometimes I feel like the edges are maybe too sharp or too soft. It, it really depends. I will throw on a refine hard mat. I take off the decontaminate. I take off the reduce chatter. I take off the motion blur. 
it just evens out the edges. And then the last thing is advanced spill suppressor. Takes away that green. Make sure to put it on ultra mode. Standard mode is kind of stupid. And now we've got a clean creek. Now we've got a clean kick. So boom, bada bing. Now you can track an After Effects the built-in camera tracker and send it over to Blender with AE to blend, but motion tracking in Blender is pretty easily and there's a thousand other better tutorials. So let me just get right to it. Click the motion tracking tab. Well, you load it in our footage. You want to click a track and set the scene frames and they'll do the prefetch and that lets it road into RAM and you then detect features. Wow, that's not a lot of features it detected. Surely there's more features. Let's tell it that there is. Turn down your margin. Turn down your threshold. It likes to be threshy with the threshold. I don't like threshy thresholds. Click track forward. It tracks forward. Go back to the frame and track backwards. And look at that. It's already tracked. Now, like I said before, this shot is really easy to track, which is also why I kind of did it in After Effects. But Blender is better because once you bring it into the scene. Oh my God. I forgot to solve. Clean tracks reprojection error the lower the number the better it's like golf solve camera move it 0.37 pixels we're back in the game baby just like tiger woods and then you go to your object constraints and you can add the camera solver and as you can see this little line right here is the camera path line it basically shows you what your camera did on the day it's quite magical all right so now we've got the camera move we've got the camera path it's moving it's accurate what we're going to do is load in our green screen plate. You can see I've already done it here. You can load this in. I exported this out as a PNG sequence with alpha. We place it into the scene. And this is where Ian Hubert really came in. Select the plane, select the camera, copy location, copy rotation. And then once you keyframe the scale, you have your character sitting in place. If I go to this view, you can sort of see it's magic and it looks like the frame shrinks around him rather than him moving. And then once you have all that, you can put him anywhere. I you have a track camera, then I have a second camera. I add all my other little settings here. Sometimes I like to switch it to panoramic. I put the aspect ratio of the lens to two. So it gives it more of that vertical bokeh. You can rack focus. If I move this around, it changes the focus. And so that allows you to do so much. You can move the camera. You can extend camera move. You can whip pan in. And this is something I use constantly. And the other great effect of actually having the plate in the 3D scene is you can put things in front of it. I've got these volumetric lights. I just made these cones that are parented to these spotlights. Now that cone of light goes in front of them like he's actually in the scene. You can add in realistic flares. You can add in dust and debris and make it go in front of the camera. You can do all these magical things. And then you still get your color properties. You want it to match the background more. Get up all in here and see how fun it is. This is how the footage came in, which doesn't look right. So I brought it down. There's a lot of great benefits of actually having the plate in frame. And the last step to really tie all this in that helps you a lot as much as I love the sort of in viewport compositing, when you render these things, you want to give yourself as much flexibility as possible. So what do I do? I render in EXR. EXR is this magical substance. I don't know where they found it, but they somehow got it into Blender and allows you to render in layers open EXR multi-layer. And now if you go over to this little button right here, that is your view layer properties passes. This is what the combined layer is. It's everything you see before you, my child. You can go into an emission layer. All the things that are emissive, my child. You can go into mist. If you don't want your graphics card to explode, but you still want to add volumetrics to your scene, this is a good way to sort of cheat it. When you render this, which should be no problem for my four 4090s I have, you get your motion blur, you get your realistic lighting, you get all your stuff that you want. But you also get all these other layers. Look at this. If you name this something sensible, you're in a good spot. Emit, AO, interior index material so I can isolate these layers and recolor them later. Mist, I've got it. If we go to the other view layer, I've got my subject, right? But then I've also got an index object of my subject so I can perfectly key him out and recolor him differently later in the compositing. EXR, wherever they found it, when they unearthed it from the annals of South Africa. I thank them. All right, you've seen the scenes. You've seen the, the magical EXR material. You've seen the tracking. You've seen the keen. Let's get to compositing. This is my favorite part uh, because this is where it all comes together and it looks good. Look at that.
So let's talk about compositing. Compositing is basically when you take your 3D exports, some of your other elements like your 2D stuff and mix it all together, make it look good, make it look like it fits together. I would like to note that I use some Red Giant in this because I am a corporate shill and let's get into it. Right click, interpret footage, main 23976 because that's the project that we're doing. We're not doing 30 FPS. That's for heathens. You drop it into the comp and it is black. Why is that? Because EXR is weird and it's got all these layers. So you need to unpackage them. So you use this EX Tractor R Extractor, EXR Extractor. Throw that on there and look at that. It's dark. What the fuck? Then you throw on this Lumetri color and it gets better. Why? Because it is a LUT that is EXR to linear and it brings it all back to what it's supposed to be. And this is our starting point. On my subject ISO, I thought he was a little too bright for the scene, so I darkened him. Then I used the secret sauce, Red Giant Super Comp. Comp, 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 comp. You drag all your layers in, and it basically allows you to recreate your comp uh, that you've got down here, but up here. And that height difference is really good. No, I'm joking. It allows you to bring it in here, and then you can have layers affect other layers. Let me show you. Once you add this layer on top, you can go in and you can have all these different effects you can do. I built a preset that adds on all these four little effects. One matches the color. So if I turn that off, it adjusts the color just a little bit to make it match the scene. This just blends the edges ever so slightly. This does the beautiful, beautiful light wrap. So it really makes it feel like it's part of the scene. So when you turn it on, that orange just subtly comes over the edge. Same thing with the blues and the shadows and everything. It sort of just embeds it into the background, which I like. And then I added some diffusion, which is just kind of like a black pro mist type filter. And then over everything, I add on the other secret sauce, glow. You bloom those lights, you bloom those colors. Looks real nice. Add some camera lens blur for when it's back here. I made it out of focus so that it made it different and cool and I used camera lens blur and with an aspect ratio set to 0.8 so it gives it that anamorphic look I don't know and then a second lumetry to make it more blue instead of purple and then some grain you always gotta add some grain because real cameras got grain in it last thing I would typically do I didn't do it in this project which I'm actually surprised by is to add some lens flares I think lens flares are uh, can be overused but they can also be really cool Let's talk about lens flares. Here's another one of my favorite shots from the ticketing spot we created. Him in the corner of the display room. One of the things I did here was add this little bloom up top. Again, using Red Giant's No Light Factory. It gives these realistic lens flares. And you can add them everywhere. I put them off frame. I put them all over top of light sources sometimes. It's the same way when you do modeling and texturing in your 3D scenes where you're adding imperfections. When you're adding fingerprints, when you're adding smudges and grime and dirt to the edges of things, surface imperfections are what give things this sense of realism. Constantly I'm trying to blend the edges between the two because the light bleeds from back here over to here and then add lens flares because that light is hitting the lens of the camera and causing all this weirdness. And then that's why I add grain. All this stuff, all that bloom, all that glow, it's all to sell the realism. I think the key to all this, that good 3D track match the 3D scene's lighting to what you captured on the day. We shot this particular shot in all white light. I don't want to put this shot on this shot. The focal length is different. The colors are different. That wouldn't make sense. You want to match the lighting of your scene to the lighting of your character. And then you want to have a perfect camera track. And then you want to add those imperfections. Imperfections make perfection. And after days and days and months and months and weeks and weeks of doing shot after shot, Jovan Tremel's eyes went blurry. He had to get glasses. He had to seek refuge in his bed at times. But after months and months, he climbed out of that hole, that green screen hole, victorious. He fooled everyone that watched. 
that maybe they did actually put these people on Tron versions of Chicago locations. Maybe he did actually build that display room. Maybe he did line them up in front of these neon lights. Probably not, but we can suspend disbelief for just a little longer. So yeah, green screen, thank you for watching. Don't let Christopher Nolan sway you away from liking green screen. Mr. Green Screen is our friend. Let's, so let's bring him in close, give him a big hug, and say goodbye to all the set designers out there. In the future, all films will look like Zack Snyder films. All right, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. It's not easy doing green screen. Having to spend so much time doing Roma King. Just when I think it could be easy, I gotta do some Rotoween.